Thank you for joining this session of the Impact Series. We're talking about social determinants of healthcare for diverse communities, improving access and outcomes by looking at non-health issues. I'm Lauren Summers. I'm Senior Director of Lifelong Learning and Travel at the Yale Alumni Association. And I'm pleased to be joined today by two distinguished guests that we are in conversations with. Uh, Dr. Sten Vermund, who is Dean of the Yale School of Public Health, the Anna M. R. Lauder Professor of Public Health, and Professor of Pediatrics at the Yale School of Medicine. Sten, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And our second guest is Kevin Nelson. He is Chief Executive Officer of Aetna Better Health of New York former president of the Association of Yale Alumni in Public Health, and former chair of its Emerging Majority Affairs Committee. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Good to be here. So let's get the conversation going. And I'd love to start off with you, Sten. I know early in your career, you did a great deal of work overseas. And I'm really curious to know, how did that inform your perspectives on the social determinants of health here in the U.S.? So I developed a very strong interest in global health, and I saw the, the social determinants of disease that were prominent in the U.S. being even more prominent internationally, and poverty in the U.S. being even more pronounced overseas. And that launched me on a, um, I guess it's 40-year career now, uh, who's counting, uh, uh, in, in the field of global health. I've always had a domestic projects that have sort of been in parallel with my international projects. So when I was working in Africa, in uh, Zambia, Nigeria, and Mozambique on the U.S. president's plan for AIDS relief, so-called PEPFAR, where we were trying to uh, uh, ramp up uh, HIV care in uh, rural and urban Africa in places that traditionally didn't have access to chronic disease services. They, they only had acute care services, um, and uh, that was an immensely challenging uh, part of my life. I was also working on um, access to care for uh, impoverished communities in the rural South. Um, I had worked in Alabama and Tennessee, and uh, I saw a lot of parallels in the work that I was doing in Africa with the work that I could do in my own backyard. So... Um, I was actually really curious about that when you were, you know, we were talking before the panel and you were kind of describing some of the things that you saw in these communities. What kinds of things did you see as being similar? Well, transportation is a chronic challenge. Uh, we do not have a clinic in every small community. We, for financial reasons, we consolidate clinical services. So that means that people in rural areas have to travel. Um, another challenge is even if there is a, cl a clinic in your community, uh, your cousin might be the receptionist and your uncle uh, might be the nurse. Uh, in other words, you, you, you don't necessarily want to go to that clinic if you have a stigmatizing disease. And I've worked on HIV since the mid-1980s, and that's a very stigmatizing disease. I worked on sexually transmitted infections, uh, and those are stigmatizing. Even COVID-19 is perceived to be stigmatizing in some, in some sub, subgroups, and obesity can be stigmatizing. I mean, there are a lot of diseases where we blame the victim, where we, where we point fingers. And uh, all of these things, I think, uh, can be immensely challenging when you're in a small community. So this is exactly what we saw in Africa in villages. Um, people were uncomfortable going to the small uh, clinic because the nurse in that clinic and the employees of that clinic all knew everybody. And uh, privacy was not uh, by any means guaranteed. So um, trying to find ways for people in rural settings to access um, confidential, private, and good quality health care. That was a universal challenge, whether it was in the U.S. or internationally. I remember I was in medical school, and uh, uh, the very first uh, winter holiday 
uh, around Hanukkah and Christmas time uh, that I had. I went to um, see United Farm Worker, uh, I'm sorry, United Mine Worker clinics in West Virginia. And this was the depths of uh, winter, you know, and uh, it was really quite a kind of gloomy atmosphere. But I was very inspired by what I saw because they had innovated in having uh, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. And back then, that was a little unusual. Um, and they had created networks. So in small communities in West Virginia, you had immediate um, health care and you had telemedicine to the doctor in the more distant city. And the doctor would come to these clinics uh, once a month, um, and or, or the individual could be transported elsewhere. Well, we borrowed these ideas in Africa and created very similar sorts of networks where very minimal care was provided in the village, but there was a good network to secure more advanced care um, this was not our invention. Uh, Sydney and Emily Kark uh, were innovators in this space in, uh, south, in apartheid South Africa in the 1940s and 50s. But I had read some of their work um, and uh, was inspired by it because they were uh, trying to do exactly what we were doing. So uh, the French have a phrase, plus que ça change, plus que c'est la même chose. So the more things change, the more things stay the same. So often we just have to reinvent what others have before us have uh, crafted. And uh, we're working on that in the School of Public Health right now with the general theme of community health workers. We think that community health workers can be deployed in the state of Connecticut in ways that are not wildly dissimilar from how they're deployed in low and middle income countries overseas. But community health workers are not licensed or credentialed in the state, and therefore, it's just about impossible to get their services reimbursed by Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance. So we're working with the state on trying to craft a very credible curriculum, a very um, um, uh, excellent uh, sort of credentialing process, and reassuring the funders that they uh, are getting highly efficient and effective services from community health workers and uh, on, on, uh, making it easier for doctors and nurses to do their jobs. So, you know, there, there are a lot of cross talk. Well, and, and we have uh, Kevin here today, so we can, so from the Aetna perspective, we can ask him lots of questions on, on that topic as well. Um, but before we go to Kevin, I, I just wondered one other part of your background, if you could share, um, you talked about the rural connection between some of the things that you've seen overseas and how you see it sort of replicated in rural communities here in the U.S. And I wonder how that is similar or different to some of the things you've seen in your career working in the cities. You know, I know you had a lot of great stories about being in Harlem in the Bronx and, and some of the things that you saw as a pediatrician there and how that really impacted impacted your perspective on social determinants of healthcare. In New York City, um, back in the 70s, uh, it was uh, the law that land own, uh, land, uh, that, uh, that that um, landlords had to provide um, window guards for any family with children under the age of three. Uh, and yet, I saw child after child come into our emergency room having fallen out of windows. Um, sometimes they fell out of a second story window and landed in a bush and just broke a, broke, broke, a, broke a bone. And sometimes they fell out of a seven story window and came to die in our emergency room. And, um, this really affected me um, the same way that the, the dead children from not having had their uh, diphtheria uh, vaccine affected me. And time and time again, I saw an imbalance between the resources that we were putting in for medical care and the resources we were putting in for social services. And... Um, this is a problem we have in the United States generically. The amount of money that the European nations spend on social services and on 
medical services is about the same as what we spend in the U.S., but the mix is quite different. In Europe, they spend much more on social services and much less on medical services. And they get better outcomes than we do. So it's a fool's errand to hospitalize a homeless individual and stabilize their status asthmaticus and then send them back out to, into the street because they are then going to return to the hospital with continuing asthma problems because the street is a really good home to have chronic asthma. A home that can be warmed is going to help you with your chronic asthma. So the reality is, um, regardless of what problem people have, whether it's asthma or diabetes, um, if they're food insecure uh, and they eat uh, foods that are not optimal for them and they have a weight problem or whatever it might be, um, if you have um, secure housing, if you have uh, food security, if you have a job, if you have your your children in adequate schooling or daycare and uh, they have uh, reasonable after-school activities, then you can um, use health services less. If you are ho uh, housing insecure, food insecure, you don't have a job, you will use health services more. And we can also throw in outpatient mental health and substance use services. So our imbalance in our society, in where we invest, is we're, we're paying a terrible price for this. So we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world, by far. We're flirting with 19% of our gross national product being spent on health. There's no, the, the, only, the only country in Europe that comes even close is Switzerland, and they're 14%. And most European countries are around 10%. So they're spending about half of what we are in medical um, care, but they have better outcomes. If you look at the 32 or 33 countries that are considered high income comparable countries, uh, Western European countries, uh, Canada, US, Australia, Japan, et cetera, and you compare these countries, we are dead last in our um, healthcare indices. Uh, we have the lowest, uh, um, um, the, the, the life expectancies we have among the highest, um, uh, infant mortalities, uh, you can go through the whole list and we are bottom three for virtually every category. Now, why is that? Why do we spend the most and get the worst outcomes? And it all ties back to social determinants of disease. And the inability of our health system to talk to our social service system and to be better balanced. So I would say that uh, rather than investing um, more money into our curative health uh, system to try to cope with the problems of the homeless, I would like us to balance that and um, house them and we will spend less on their medical care. And this sounds immensely logical, but we don't do it in the United States. Our incentives are misaligned. And what happens is we underfund prevention and we therefore pay a much higher price for our curative services. Yeah, this is a really excellent point. Uh, we promised that we weren't gonna hold Kevin's feet to the fire. Uh, in this conversation. <laughs> nothing, nothing I have said has surprised <laughs> no. Kevin Nelson. No. He is living and breathing these issues every single day on the front lines. So I'm dying to hear what he has to say. Yeah. So um, Kevin, I would love to just give get, give you a chance to um, speak a bit to your background and what you've seen on the front lines in, in, the, in your career. Sure. So, so first, then, so effectively, really got to the crux of the matter here in this country in terms of what the focus is in both energy and dollars, um, and how it, it's related to the poor outcomes that we have as it relates to social determinants. So, you know, so for me, my exposure to health disparities, uh, to health care access and delivery challenges, uh, began early in my career um, on the front line from a business perspective. Um, both from the provider side, the payer side, and also the vantage point of a humanitarian organization. I was with UNICEF. 
So on the provider side, my first role out of college was an administrative role at a community health center, Jersey City Family Health Center in Jersey City here in the Northeast. And then a few years later, uh, I moved, went down to the South, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, where I was at Brady Memorial Hospital, a big public hospital, similar to Harlem Hospital in New York, um, where I managed and oversaw the operations of the medical and surgical emergency rooms. So a lot of exposure to underserved communities. And there were three themes that were consistent um, or have been consistent that I will call out. Uh, one, and I'll speak a little bit to some of the details behind it, underserved communities by and large are also uninformed, uneducated. The second is that shortage or sometimes absence of support services, some that that's then alluded to, and also shortage of options. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit more on that. And then third are that priorities eclipse healthcare when it comes to certain individuals based on their challenges. And those priorities are the social determinants that we are now calling them. So those are three that I've seen, I've seen you know, in various communities, different parts of the country and throughout my career. So it didn't just, you know, start the community health center and the public hospital, but after that. And when you say priorities, just to make sure everybody, you know, is sure. following us, you're speaking about people's life priorities of yes. their basic survival. Correct. Is Correct. is something that they're putting above their health care because they have to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And starting with that, I work backwards then in sort of those three themes, you know, so on the priorities and and I know we'll talk later about some progress. And what I will say now, though, about progress is those priorities I'm calling out, which I noted early on in my career, um, were not called out as anything in particular, which are now social determinants of health by and large. Right. So, yes, these are other life priorities. They are food, um, their jobs, you know, they are housing. Um, also priorities that we may not think about, such as, you know, their children's education, not just the education, but the, what we consider very basic, having the supplies to go to school. Um, you know, the first day of school and the days that, that follow that first day of school, focused on that. Um, having child care and elder care services in place and supports in place. And on the child care, on the, on the education supplies, just for a minute, I had an experience a few years ago, uh, Operation Backpack, which is a volunteer um, organization, Volunteers of America, and they have an initiative called Operation Backpack, where they raise funds for New York City children, about 20,000 a year, to um, provide them with backpacks. And I thought that's so basic and I hadn't thought about, and they tell stories and children firsthand of going, getting on that bus that first day and not having one thing and sitting next to a child in class who has, you know, their calculator and their notebooks and very basic things that, you know, we just run to staples and purchase. So just so things that we may not even think about, we all think of housing, we all think of food insecurity, we all think of jobs, but there are so many other, what might be called minor, but are not minor, priorities that people have, and they, again, eclipse healthcare. So they are now called social determinants of health, by and large, and that's a good thing. We'll talk more about that. But that has been in existence from my beginning experience in, in healthcare. The absence um, or, or the shortage of support services, right? So job training, um, housing support. And then with food, you know, food insecurities, there are, you know, a number of aspects to that. Certainly there is the very, very straightforward not having access to food, right? What I have found, though, in my experience is that that is not as much an issue. Certainly it's an issue, and I don't want to minimize it, but the food is there. It's the right food, right? Mm -hmm. So the option part of that, right? So what are my options? But first you have to understand the need for a different option or different options when it comes to food and what that means for your health. And then, and that can be done, and I've seen it accomplished, the bigger challenge, because it's bigger than, you know, an organization, is having access to that and affordable access. So, you know, and, and I, my, my office actually is located in Harlem and Harlem Grown is an organization that focuses on urban farming. So, you know, you educate families and children, they do a phenomenal job on what it is to eat healthy. But that's step one, how do you get them access to those stores that are not in the neighborhood where they can purchase those healthy foods, right? If those stores are there, because now there's a Whole Foods in Harlem. That there's a Whole Foods on 125th yeah, Street. Yeah, but try to go packed all the time. Packed all the time, but you're not going to find the individuals who are underserved being able to purchase the foods they need to in any quantity, but given the prices, right? Mm -hmm. So you can then make it available. Then how do you make it affordable? So so those are the supports that, that aren't there or the options that aren't there. And then the last of the three themes that I called out is the um, lack of information and education, right? So these communities and individuals by and large, there are some exceptions, you know, don't understand what we consider to be basic knowledge. You know, what is hypertension? What is diabetes? What's type one, what's type two? What's prenatal care? Why do you need prenatal care? You know, what's good prenatal care and what happens to your child if you don't get prenatal care? You know, screening, you know, which we know is very common and in communities there are screening bans and all, but there are individuals who don't think of screening one because they don't know it or don't believe, understand the importance of it and how much it can prevent future ailments, particularly as it relates to cancer and others. And the last I'll call out, and there are many more though, it's, it's really um, 
particular to communities of color, African-American communities and communities of color, and that's mental health and how it's, it's been taboo. It's less so now. Um, when I first started, it was very taboo to have conversations around mental health, to suggest that anyone had a behavioral mental health issue, um, to address that issue. Um, not long ago, I had a conversation with someone who shared that someone that they know is struggling with mental health issues. They didn't describe it that way. That is what it was. And I asked about, you know, were they getting any treatment, any medication? And their response was, well, no, you know, the family doesn't believe in medication because there are side effects. So, you know, they're just managing. And this person basically is not working and all these other challenges. But there goes again, you know, this taboo feeling that you can't have a conversation. You can't understand that it is a physiological condition, you know. Um, so that is an, another item within the, the communities of color, particularly underserved, that's not addressed. There's so, a distrust of the system. Dis- there is a sense of maybe it implies weakness yes. to seek mental health. There's a sense of perhaps it's a it's a problem of your faith, that yes. your faith is not strong enough, depending on what people's faith traditions are. And then there's a gap in the understanding between providers and people who provide health care information right. and the cultural factors mm-hmm. that, you know, that are oriented in these communities. So there's a real challenge in, in making that connection. There is, without question, there is. So those are you know, from the provider perspective, from the payer. So I've worked both at nonprofit and for-profit health plans. I'm the current role at, at, at of course, a for-profit plan. Um, but I will say that, well, for the for-profit, more of a challenge, but it existed in the nonprofit world as well. The observations that I have there are around sensitivity. So cultural sensitivity and, and knowledge and, you know, how do you how do you adapt? Um, how are you conscious that you need to adapt as you're servicing, providing services to individuals, um, particularly um, working for for-profit where you may have a network of providers who are um, who have fewer Medicaid and other individuals underserved communities as their patient base. So they will see those patients, but they're not accustomed to it. So they haven't made the adjustments and they're not even aware. Um, so there's that. There are language barriers, you know, exist throughout. Again, for the nonprofit, networks tend to be more diverse and you can get there, but there are challenges that I'll speak to later in getting that diversity. Um, there's that. And then the last one, and certainly not the least, because it really leads to the disparities, and that's lack of coverage, right? So there are about 31 million uninsured Americans right now. You know, the categories, the large categories of uninsured, of course, are the the uninsured working, right? They have jobs, either the jobs aren't provided or they're self-employed and they can't afford it. Insurance is extremely you know, expensive. So these are individuals and their families who are in the society, in community, um, but not able to purchase their insurance. And then you have, of course, those who are not employed, same thing, individuals and families um, who do not have insurance. But then you also have Medicaid recipients. And the plans that I've worked for have been Medicaid plans. And people will probably assume, and it's not a bad assumption, that if you have Medicaid, your coverage, you're good, right? Your coverage, you're good. And that is fine as long as you're covered. Um, the issue with Medicaid and any government service program, it varies by state, is that coverage is for Medicaid in New York annual. So that means every year you need to recertify in order to make sure you're covered with Medicaid. And people will be astounded by the number of people who do not recertify or get recertified. Um, We started an initiative in My Planet Aetna to make sure that happens. Um, But the point is that if you let that lapse, you will not have coverage. So you can be Medicaid eligible all you want. If you didn't recertify, you are then in that bucket of individuals who are uninsured. And all of those uninsured individuals those including who had coverage like Medicaid are getting their services that are all, you know, they're not, they're not preventive, right? They're curative and usually delivered in an emergency room, you know, where last I looked, it was about 8 billion or so in, in unnecessary ER utilization, right? So that's where all this is happening and no continuity. So, you know, so from both the provider side and the payer side, there have been challenges. And I've seen over the years, those challenges, you know, resurface. I see some improvement on some, but there's still work to do. And I I can speak to that um, later, but I'll, I'll stop there. No, this is great. I think between the two of you all, you've really outlined the context and the foundation of a lot of the issues, as well as I think, Kevin, you've given us a good sense of the landscape where it is now um, and, a, and a really excellent outline of, of what some of the most important issues are to deal with in terms of the social determinants. Um, I wonder, just going back to you, Sten, if you, you come in from the public health perspective and just maybe speak to some of the points that Kevin has raised in terms of the education, the support services, and the prioritization that he outlined. You know, if you have a, a, an empirical perspective on it or um, some solutions that you've seen that you know would work to solve some of those issues. In the past couple of years, uh, I do think we are starting a healthier narrative 
around some of the structural obstacles to addressing issues that Kevin has raised. Um, what do I mean by that? So if you analyze how schools are funded, they're not funded through um, broad-based income taxes at a state level or federal support. They're funded by local property taxes. So in my career as a pediatrician and as an epidemiologist, uh, I've worked in many school settings. In the past year, in COVID-19, we've been working in a variety of school settings. And um, you have the richest schools, the best capacitated in the richest neighborhoods. And you have the poorest schools, the least well capacitated in the poorest neighborhoods. So that is a systemic way that we support schools. Schools, it's not... It's not amenable to a quick fix because we've set it up that way. It's property taxes that support schools. Um, it's kind of what people talk about when they say structural. And that's activities. right. Structural racism, we could say. And so um, you don't fund roads through local property taxes. That's seen as a popular good. It's a general good. Roads are typically funded at a state level or even a federal subsidy level, but we don't look at schools that way. We don't see the school in a poor neighborhood in Bridgeport or New Haven uh, as as a, a public good, um, and yet we are willing to fund prisons at any any astronomical level. So I feel like uh, we disadvantage certain youth inherently, and then we advantage other youth. And the microcosm of that was uh, expressed by Kevin when he talked about his backpack program. So there's some kids who are better off and kids not so well off. And the kids who are not so well off within a given school are an immediate disadvantage, socially, educationally, uh, self-esteem at every level. So this uh, lack of homogenization of uh, childhood uh, support um, in terms of uh, educational opportunity and, and other opportunity is a, is a huge uh, deficit for, for kids. There, there are people listening to this, to this um, um, presentation who, who are first gen. They're the first people in their families to go to college. And they know what I'm talking about. And they know what kind of um, obstacles they had to overcome. And they can probably think of a friend of theirs who um, did not manage to overcome those obstacles. And yet probably would have done fine if they hadn't had the obstacles to begin with. So the reality is we've got a lot of these examples in society of structural disadvantage. Uh, I don't want to go into the history books, but if you are brought to America and you're enslaved and then you run up against Jim Crow and um, your family wealth has not been permitted to grow and it hasn't been permitted to grow for 300 years. And now you come into the 1960s and there's still structural disadvantages. Um so, you know, those sorts of those sorts of comparators. Meanwhile, the person who stole your family wealth by cheating your great great grandfather is now as a consequence well off. So these these we talk about reparations. There's a reason we talk about reparations. Um, people people will say things like, well, why are why are Asians doing so much better? as immigrants to America than um, Hispanic persons from Latin America. And my answer is there are um, very uh, hot, uh, rigid criteria for getting a visa from most Asian countries. And if you bring money or if you bring a, 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 a functional skill set, like you're a computer program or whatever, it's easier to get a visa. But if you come to America from Latin America, we're permitting people to come in by the um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands to be farm workers because Americans won't do those jobs in the farms anymore. They, so so we, we over-represent undereducated people from one part of the world 
and we 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 welcome only overeducated people from another part of the world. So we we don't. It's an absurd comparison. And then, we, and then we're not taking care of. And so we're, we're, so we're really eager to get them to come in to to be farm workers, for That's example. Right. And, and but we're this, not providing this, them with the support services that they need to move forward in society. And this comes into Yale's story. We were sued by the the Trump Justice Department for biased uh, bias against Asians and bias in favor of communities of color. When the when the playing field of these uh, uh, populations is completely different, and I'm not saying we should discriminate against anybody, but the fact that Yale um, chooses its students based on a variety of criteria, to me, is a strength of our university, not a not not a weakness. It's it's a really interesting point that you bring up, Stan, about education and how education is not seen as a common social good. Whereas we fund prison systems sort of unilaterally without, you know, looking at what is the property tax basis, for example, of the community that is supporting the prison. Um, and, you know, I, I raise that because there is a professor at Yale, Emily Wang, who's done a lot of research on um, on prison systems and medicine in prison systems. And one of the things that she pointed out that I, I found fascinating is that for many of the prisoners, that is the first time that they've received any kind of healthcare screening or preventative care and that they are getting better care in prison than they were in society for all manner of different ailments. Um, so, you know, I wonder if you could speak to that, Kevin, from your perspective, you know, on this disparity between how we fund support services for different communities and how we provide education uh, to enable them to access healthcare. Yeah, the, the funding without question, and, you know, Stan raised it early in terms of where our dollars go in this country. Um, so it, it does not go to those areas that, that require attention. Um, education, I would say first, is, is one of the key equalizers in any society, and that doesn't, doesn't um, exclude the U.S. And I also, and I want to make sure I answer your question, but Stan touched on something I really want to get to because I think it's really important in the conversation and about you know, the history of this country and how some groups, um, whites in particular, have had a 300 plus advantage over people of color in many aspects. And you spoke to the financial advantages. Um, there's also education um, and also representation, right? So I talked about progress that had been made in terms of social determinants. One area where there has been product, progress, but very small, and that's because of the history, and that's representation. And you know, representation is so important when it comes to making decisions um, about how you execute, what you execute. Um, you know, when I think about the numbers of, uh, there are over a million physicians and recently checked on this and about 5% are black African-American, about 6% Latin, about 17% Asian, over 55% white, right? And that does not match up with the proportions that Absolutely these groups Absolutely. pick up in society. Absolutely right? not. Absolutely not. And then from a business perspective, because that, that's healthcare and that's the delivery of healthcare, which is critical, but there's also the business aspect, which I'm part of. And in that area, there's only five to 9% of the CEOs for health organizations, hospitals, and health plans in this country. Um, maybe about 14% or so board representation of color. And that is equally important because that's where the decisions are made when it comes to operationalizing, you know, these, these, initiatives and, and programs um, for the communities. And I cannot, I cannot emphasize enough how much having someone, and we hear this particularly now in recent conversations about you know, diversity, you know, equity, and inclusion, but it's always been the situation. When those voices, when those brains are not around the table, there are so many opportunities that are missed. Um, there are so many dollars that are wasted <laughs> um, because they're spent on what you think you should be doing instead of what you know you should be doing because the person who's giving you that direction knows by experience. So I, I just want to make sure that's called out because as we talk about addressing health disparities and the social determinants, it is so critical that we make sure that that includes a diverse group and an intentional effort to make that group diverse. Because again, the history has us behind. So you have to be intentional, focused about going out, looking for, making sure part of the group that you have is a, are individuals who don't look like you. 
So I, I, you know, so I, I hope that I got to some of what you're asking, but I, I wanted to share because Sten touched on that. And I don't want to have this conversation go without really raising how critical it is that diversity be part of. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, well, that's the whole point of this impact conference is, um, you know, is advancing diversity, equity, inclusion through social change. And what you're speaking to is that is the social change of what is the leadership? And I think too often in the conversation about healthcare, we talk about disparities. Yes. We talk about disadvantages. Um, we talk about communities that are underserved, but we don't talk about the absence of these same representatives from these communities in CEO C-suite positions, in political positions of authority where they can take a look at how funds are spent and, and how tax laws are created. That's an, that's another important issue, right? It, it's never part of the conversation about health. So I'm, I'm glad that you raised that. And Stan, you look like you want, you want to comment on that point. There is a related theme, which is how we operationalize public policy. So, um, Kevin was very articulate in highlighting the uh, challenges of, of persons who do not have health insurance in our country. So when you think about that, um, you have to go back to uh, Medicare and Medicaid in the 1960s, uh, Medicare for the elderly, Medicaid for the poor, and uh, the VA system for our veterans the Indian Health Service for um, Native Americans on reservations, um, the prison health service for our prisoners, and uh, and then um, private health insurance for people who are typically employed. So there are employer-employee contributions. And that leaves a lot of people out. And when I was a, a busy pediatrician, they were the ones, the ones left out were the ones who overrepresented our emergency room because they would uh, not have a comfortable um, primary care relationship because they didn't have money to pay the doctor. And so they would avoid health care. And then when there was an emergency, they would bring their child to the emergency room, but they often brought the child somewhat late compared to somebody who had insurance. And that could be public insurance or private insurance, didn't matter. The Medicaid patients had no, no obstacles coming in. But the working poor, the people who um, were making too little money um, to re uh, for an employer who was not offering private health insurance, uh, like McDonald's, Walmart, that sort of thing, and was making uh, too much money, to qualify for Medicaid. And that's precisely what Romney Care was designed to fix in the state of Massachusetts. And Romney Care, which was a kind of private sector oriented fix patch for the working poor, was what Obamacare was built upon in the federal government. But by the time that the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, was promulgated by President, former President Obama, we had such a toxic kind of a narrative in, 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 in Washington that just because Obama and the Democrats proposed it meant that the Republicans were going to, uh, proposed that the Republicans were going to oppose it. And despite the fact that it was built upon a Republican governor's model, Mitt Romney. So it, 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 it was shocking that um, over 20 states in the United States refused to implement uh, Obamacare. So they left their working poor uninsured rather than spend the 10 percent, which would get them the 90 percent federal contribution. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb with our audience, and I'm going to say that was a really good example of systemic racism. Because communities of color were hit much harder than most other communities. Although all poor people in, in the state of West Virginia, you know, it would be, it would be more white uh, poor people who would be affected. But whether white or black you, uh, or Hispanic, you ended up um, uh, harming the working poor. 
And the working poor in general um, is going to overrepresent communities of color. And for state legislators and governors and governors to do that, I think was another example of an extreme level of structural dysfunction in our country. When a thoughtful, reasonable, affordable solution to ensure tens of millions of the working poor in America was rejected by almost half the states of America. And uh, I feel like if we don't gain um, uh, a better narrative in our policymaking, we're going to continuously make these dysfunctional decisions that hurt the most vulnerable in our society. Well, and not to mention hurt the society overall, right? Because right. because we know that that preventative care, as you just described in your example, cuts costs of spending overall on health care because you're catching conditions earlier when they're less expensive to treat. I'd love to hear Kevin uh, commenting on that because... I'm not a health economist and I'm not experienced in, in, in the health insurance industry, but it seems to me that if an uninsured person is cared for at Yale New Haven Hospital or, um, or you know, any hospital, um, that somehow your, your clients are charged more because the hospital has to function. And if they're providing um, charity service, they have to they have to keep the lights on. They have to, you know, support their radiology department. And they, so doesn't that somehow get uh, uh, do, 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 don't your um, ins insurance clients have to pay more at the end of the day? That's not the case, but there is an impact. Um, Stan, I'll tell you what it is. So you're right. It's, it comes down to dollars. right? All that we're talking about is about dollars. Right. And and the impact that healthcare lack thereof generates in terms of dollars. Um, and I want to comment a little bit on what we need to do on the policy side to get there. But to respond, um, Sten, what happens? So the members that are part of my plan and the plans I've worked for are on Medicaid. So as a Medicaid recipient, you are not responsible for paying any bills, right? So Medicaid also um, pays less than commercial and even Medicare, and Medicare pays less than commercial. All that to say that providers, which is part of the problem to access. So providers, because of that, you know, are not it's very difficult or challenging to find providers who will provide services to those who receive Medicaid because they know the billing, the payment that they will receive will be considerably less than they would get if that person was on a commercial plan. So as a result, they will deny access to a member or members. So hospitals, certain hospitals, of course, have to, they by, by, you know, by, by law would have to see individuals, but that's at a hospital um, level. And again, we're talking about not preventive. When they get to the hospital, it's curative. So what happens again as a result of the payment structure, Medicaid being a lower payer than any other insurer, providers will say no to Medicaid. And so our biggest challenge, and even at Aetna, it's a for-profit company, but we still depend on a provider network that we have to build. And you can't force a physician to join your network. So our conversations, and because we're Aetna, so we have all the product. We have commercial, we have Medicare, we have Medicaid. So we have providers who see our commercial members and our Medicare members. And when we go and have conversations with some of them, they do not want to see the Medicaid. So here's this big national brand, you know, where an individual says, I'm going to enroll in Aetna because Aetna is a big national brand. Um, they don't know that behind the scenes here we are working, you know, desperately on some cases to get a provider to see them because they're Medicaid. So the, the issue is really around access as it relates to providers and the payments that they receive, because it's all driven by payments and the lack thereof. So there's no attention to that population. And then it gets to what I mentioned earlier, since you're not focused on that population, you're not focused on the need to be culturally sensitive. Um, you're not focused on the need to have other language capabilities. You're not focused on any of that. And so that is what, in the end of the day, has been a challenge for me, both in the for-profit and, and the nonprofit world um, when it comes to Medicaid and Medicaid recipients. It sounds like you're saying, Kevin, that there's a policy solution to that. Well, you know, there, there are many policy solutions, but what I would say is that when I sort of comment on earlier, it's, of course, about the dollar. I mean, what I find hasn't happened, in my opinion, I think the challenge has been, how do you, how do you get politicians, quite frankly, because that's where the policy comes from, to understand the cost impact of not having 
social determinants of health addressed, right? Um, we're, we're getting a little bit on preventive, but still not there. Preventive is not as sexy as, you know, curing, you know? So, and we've been talking preventive care for 20 years, 30 years, I mean, more than that probably, but, you know, but it's been part of the conversation. So people pretty much know preventive care is good for you. You're supposed to have it. Dollars are still not invested. Even less for social determinants. Social determinants have only been around for about 15 years or so. I think the, the World Health Association organization, uh, 2005, came up with that commission that put together social determinants of health. Again, when I began my career, you know, more than 30 years now, it was there. No one had a name for it. Now we have a name for it, but it's only 15 years old. So you don't have real empirical data to show, you know, the impact of having social determinants of health addressed. So if you don't have it for something that's 15 years old and we don't have preventive care, that to me is the challenge. How do we get individuals to understand that you, in fact, save money when you do have preventive care and when you do address social determinants of health? Because when you have that, the policies are there. The policy ideas are there. The policy makers are there. We have some brilliant minds who have ideas that will absolutely work. It's getting the dollars behind it to put them in place. And those dollars will not come unless people are convinced that they really are saving. And that just hasn't happened yet. So I, I'm glad that you put that question on the on the table because that gets us to address a really important part of this conversation, which is, you know, we have a lot of people watching this session who want to know what they can do. And, um, you know, I think people may be in the medical profession, they may be in public health, or they may not be. They may simply be people who are activists or who are motivated to, to do something about this issue. What are the kinds of things that someone can do if they want to make a difference, make an impact on this topic? Sure. So I'll jump in first. I'm like, okay, so just a couple of ideas I have and thoughts I have, and, and it can be addressed by anyone in the categories you mentioned, Lauren, right? So, you know, first, social determinants is so huge. Um, there are so many, as you've heard us talk about over the last hour or so, you know, so many parts of that. Um, there's not, there's probably not any part that you couldn't find a way to touch. So that's first. It's so big that it requires collaboration. So no one organization, no 10, no 100 organizations can do it alone. Um, we have some initiatives going on at Aetna and my plan, and we're working with a community-based organization to make it happen. So I just want people to think broadly, you know, it's not, it's not a targeted approach, it's a collaborative approach. So that, that's one. The other is that if we start looking at those at the top of the list and people, there are 12 social determinants of health, but I, I think in Sten has called it out. I have a few, you know, food insecurity, housing, jobs, to me, are the three sort of strongest, if you will, but they, they really link into many other areas. So if you're thinking about what do I do, what space do I work in, if you can touch one of those three, that'd be great. And then how do you do it? So if you're a provider, certainly, you know, being aware first, awareness is always the starting point, right? Be aware that these are real issues and that, you know, if you are seeing someone, if you are providing, you're seeing someone, really educate yourself, get educated on what it means to not have some of the social determinants and how it impacts some of what you're asking that patient to do. And become culturally competent. Is absolutely. Not absolutely. Mean. So becoming culturally competent as a provider, that's, that is a sure way to improve, you know, social determinants of health and the outcomes related to it. You know, if you are not a provider and you're in the business part of healthcare, then again, depending on where you're working, the space you're in, finding an initiative that's possible and do a collaborative effort with an organization that addresses the social determinants. And there are many ways you can do that. But last, if you are not in healthcare or you have a role that doesn't allow you, volunteer. Volunteer because most of every one of the social determinants of health have organizations that are mostly nonprofit. In fact, I would say all nonprofit that are working to address those social determinants. So they are right in the community. Um, you know, I mentioned Harlem Grown, which is an organization uh, uh, in Harlem, and they're focused on urban farming. Someone may not think of it as being associated with social determinants, but absolutely is, right? You volunteer for Harlem Grown, you're helping families and children be educated on healthy eating, and it goes on and on. So, so think broadly, you know, again, as everybody, and there's not a person that cannot volunteer to do something in their community because social determinants is about the community. So I would encourage everyone to think broadly, think collaboratively, and uh, think and realize the impact that it has. Excellent, thank you. Sten, what about Kevin, your ideas? Kevin, Kevin has done a marvelous job. Um, I might just add two things. One is the Yale Alumni Association is a vibrant uh, volunteer organization. Uh, it's not just Yale Day of Service, which is a great thing, but it's the other 364 days where Yale alumni have mobilized for specific community level projects. 
And it's not hard to make your query through the Alumni Association be linked to like-minded individuals in your community. And you can start with a few Yaleys and then invite, invite your, uh, your Crimson colleagues and anybody else in your community to, to join forces. It doesn't have to be snooty. It can just be a Yale group that mobilizes. The second thing is I do have a soft spot for uh, schools and children. And um, there are so many opportunities for people to get involved in tutoring, in getting involved in after school activities, opening uh, doors for disadvantaged children to um, see what their, their, their future selves could look like uh, with, uh, uh, um, you know, better education, better application and better opportunity. And uh, I do think that, <laughs> excuse me, we all live in communities with schools. Schools um, uh, are unequal, as we discussed early in the call. And there are many ways to make them more equal, uh, some of which involves community mobilization, uh, assistance from better resource schools to less resource schools, and, uh, and pragmatic assistance for for children who may need some tutoring, who, who may need some guidance for after school and the like. So I, I uh, and everything that uh, Kevin said, your local United Way website is filled with the with the organizations in your community that would welcome assistance um, and sometimes organize assistance from multiple uh, alumni can be especially impactful. All right. Well, I think I will let that be the closing note of our session today. Uh, Dean Sten Vermund, Dean of the Yale School of Public Health, and Kevin Nelson, CEO of Aetna Better Health New York. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Lauren Summers from the Yale Alumni Association. I invite you to visit the Yale Alumni Association website for more Impact Conference Series content. And thank you very much for joining us.